On this episode of Resi Week, Snap AV gets acquired, Vanco acquires Beale Street Audio, and does smart home energy data even matter? All this and more on this episode of Resi Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Atlas IED, innovative audio solutions for every business environment. This is Resi Week episode 73, Acquisition Day. This is Resi Week. Welcome to Resi Week. This is your weekly wrap up of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott for avnation.tv. And today I'm pleased to be joined by Joe Whitaker. He is the president, owner, boss man, the guy at the Thoughtful Home. How are you, Joe? Doing well. Glad to be here as always. You haven't been on for a while, so I had to, you know, up my intro. Been a month or so. I know. That's what I'm saying. Been a while. Then we're joined by Mark Corbin. He is the VP of Distribution Markets at Vanco. How are you, sir? Very good. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for joining us. We're, we're looking forward to a good show. All right, gentlemen, let's kick this right off with a story that comes to us from Residential Systems. Snap AV is to be acquired by Hellman and Friedman. The transaction uh, of this acquisition is expected to close in the third quarter of 2017, but of course, none of the details have really been disclosed yet. Now, the the big deal about this is that, as uh, John, the VP of sales, says this change is indicative of their growth and the success of their company, i.e. how well they've been doing over the last couple of years as they've acquired Uh, something like 14 proprietary brands now and are servicing integrators all across uh, uh, North America. The other key point is that they're expecting the transition between equity partners to be seamless. Joe, this is, you know, we've known Snap for quite a while. You and I are both integrators. We both have access to the, uh, the massive Snap library of products. Does this new acquisition of Snap by Helmut and Freeman, and essentially the, the new partnership between the two, what is this going to mean for integrators in the field? Do they or, or should they expect to see any discernible difference in the way they're doing business with Snap? You know, there could be good and bad, obviously. You know, uh, part of the article talks about, you know, integrators are not going to see a change. There's not going to be any effect on business operations, but we, you know, we kind of heard that same thing uh, with Nortec years ago, and mm-hmm. you know, we heard the same thing with Samsung and Harman, and you know, the list goes on and on. So, so that there may be a negative impact uh, selling off of brands. Who knows? But what it could do that's a benefit is is these guys do have a big pocket of money. They do. You know, and and Snap has shown a consolidation of product categories. Mm -hmm. Now there was somebody with even bigger pockets that can do an even bigger consolidation of brands. I mean, who knows? These guys could buy Crestron if they wanted to. I mean, they they have the pockets. Yeah, they could do a crazy consolidation. But, you know, on business operations, I mean, at this point, other than going that far, you know, what else can Snap AB offer? Um, They've already covered cameras. They've covered just about everything down to the nitty gritties. Yeah. So, you know, the only thing it leaves me with is, you know, I know Adam over at Snap AV pretty well is that they may have deeper pockets for further development to develop mm-hmm. new products in new categories. Um, their R&D may get a little better. You know, they, they, they may have those things going for them. Do I think on a day-to-day it's going to change? Not at all. Not, not at all unless they start wholesaling. Um, That's true. They just have more money now. Yeah. Well, and more money's not bad. Everybody wants more money. Mark, with with the fact that they had General Atlantic uh, for a partner for so long, you know, the last four years, and now they've obviously added Hellman and Friedman, is there a bigger concern with a bigger partner that they need to hit numbers better or or, or be more profitable or, or really show that that bottom line increase that one would argue a bigger partner is going to, dare I say, demand. 
sure. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think stipulations are going to be a lot higher as far as what categories are they going to advance, advance into. To Joe's point, um, you know, they cover a lot. I'm, I'm just kind of looking something up. They're 2,700 uh, 2, SKUs and 14 pri uh, proprietary brands. So yeah. could that possibly mean they bring on more proprietary brands? Uh, I would assume with an acquisition like this, they, there's an expectation to do such things. Um, uh, maybe it's more control, maybe it's stuff like that where it can bring a lot more uh, value into it. But uh, to Joe's point, the biggest scare is they, they cover their field so well now. Uh, what are those extra areas? What are those new categories that can expand this uh, for those parent companies to be happy? You know, that's what's going to be the main focus for them. Just before we leave this this topic, one of the things that I always get concerned about watching some of these acquisitions and, and either one of you can jump in on this. Um, is there a concern that the market in general is being too consolidated? That there's not enough room for the little guy to come in and innovate dramatically? You because, mean like stifling originality? Yeah, because there's, there's, <laughs> there's a couple of big companies that well, now own massive parts of the, the market. Sure. We've, is we've this, seen it before in this industry. I mean, you have a lot of, a lot of small guys which eventually did a good acquire um, in the networking industry. Mm -hmm. And then you had control four swoop in and, you know, acquire pack edge and take over that whole thing. And, and they've got record, you know, growth and sales on the network front right now within our space. I mean, it'd be really hard for a new guy, small guy in networking to actually even make a splash or get noticed. And this could, this same thing could happen with them. I mean, you could say, um, you know, another small guy, like, I don't know, Skywalker in uh, Missouri could acquire a or decide to start a camera company, but because they can't compete on that level, yeah. they're and they may have something groundbreaking and revolutionary. But all this consolidation, it just it's killing, you know, the ability to create and the ability to grow and come up with new things. So that begs the question, what's a small startup to do? In, in, in our industry, if, if we, they want to get, not necessarily mass market, but how does somebody who, for example, wants to bring a new form of router, you know, that's designed for, for AV integrators, how's somebody like that supposed to jump in on something? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I would love to know the details of all this because that's <laughs> I mean, I probably know exactly uh, some figures because I think we all know exactly what's capable and how much they can do. I mean, I think uh, about a year ago they did 30 million alone just in speakers. So, I mean, I, I, I would think they're definitely going to start focusing a lot more on security. Uh, I think that'll be a huge focus for them going forward. Um, just from reading up on some articles, that I would have to be a focus because. As we all know from an AV standpoint, that they're very strong. So, um, very. But yeah, I th I, I'm with you. I think security and or um, Can maybe more control even something IoT. You know, is something they'll probably dive into. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's really all they have left. I, you would think IoT, a little bit of control. So we'll see where that goes. We'll see where yeah, that goes. And the demands on what, what are the brands they're going to bring in. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. going to have to be other new brands bringing in. There's got to be more branding for them. Um, I would assume if a company came to Vanco and bought us out, they would expect that to be done. You know, what, what other brands are you going to bring in? What other categories are you going to hit? Mm -hmm. and that's got to be, that's got to be an interesting process for them. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of Vanco, thanks for the, the, the beautiful lead in. Anyway. Yeah, that was, that was amazing, that segue. Um, coming to us from twice.com, Vanco International acquires Beale Street Audio. This came out uh, a little bit late last week. Vanco, who you know is, is a pretty big leader in distribution and accessory products, has acquired Beale Street Audio, who we all know has the, uh, the Sonic Vortex powered architectural speakers, which if you have not heard is a really, really cool product. Uh, and you should definitely take a listen to it. And Mark is, is from that company. Mark, what has 
uh, Vanco brought to the table for Beale Street? Yeah, I mean, absolutely great question. Um, Beale Street obviously has been a, a known brand for, for quite a while now, an incredible technology using a, uh, what they call Sonic Vortex. The main thing we bring to the table is um, stability and distribution. So uh, we have a lot of distribution that's been routed for the last 50 years the company's been in business. And um, we feel to be able to get dealers product consistently and uh, you know to always have a source to get stock from is gonna be very important from them for, for the dealers and for our distributors. So um, that's gonna be the main big difference between what Beal was doing prior um, to now is that uh, dealers will be going through distribution, but um, you know, there's going to be one main line now and it's just going to be Beale street audio. Uh, before there was two lines and it caused a little confusion with express and Beale. And, and now we're going to be uh, sum that all down to main one line in Beale street audio. So now, that's going to be the big change you're going to see uh, right off the bat for dealers. Okay. Now for, for dealers that, either our, our Vanco dealer or our direct Beal, obviously they'll go through distribution. Are there any other expected changes for existing dealers of, of either Vanco or, or Beale Street independently? Um, as far as, well, we're definitely adding to the line. So as um, dealers will see, uh, there's gonna be a lot more additions to the line, including uh, in walls, not just in ceilings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have LCRs now, pancake speakers, as well as a uh, strong 70 volt channel as well. So um, you're going to see those integrations right away into the product line. And uh, we have, a you know, quite a list down the road to start uh, evolving this technology to not just in architectural speakers, but to continue to evolve this in many other type of speakers. Uh, awesome. You know, the technology itself can be really integrated into anything. Right. Joe, as somebody who I know you've known and been involved with some of the Vanco people for quite a while, considering what we just talked about, is this just another great example of a company expanding their, their offerings and you know, really providing the best of both worlds by taking a, a product that Beale Street had that was a, a really good product and making it arguably more available to more dealers? You know, I've, I've been able to play with these guys in the speaker territory before, and I, and I always do, especially when, you know, they started coming out with amps, that they were going to get into speakers, and when they did it, it was going to be big, and it was going to be different. And, and, you know, in you know, the day's market with speaker saturation, you really have to have a technology. You have to have something that sets it apart. You can't just do another end ceiling, you know, or mm -hmm. another end wall. Um, Bill's strong suit, and, and Mark heard me say this a million times over the years, their branding was really, really good. They had, they had you know, oh, yeah. great name, great branding, great ideas, and they faltered on some things. And one of the biggest things was distribution. Mm -hmm. Their distribution channel was horrid. I mean, their tech was <laughs> entirely different than anyone else's. Don't beat around the bush. Joe, you know, tell you us how you feel. Built in back boxes. They had a lot. There was a lot of stuff going on, <laughs> but and and I sold Beal. Um, so there was a, there was a lot of things that were wrong with that scenario. But you know the fact that you know Vanco already plays in ADI. Vanco already plays in Skywalker locally for me in here in St. Louis. Vanco already plays in volume tone, mm -hmm. powerhouse. I mean, taking that brand and that tech and a speaker that really is different and putting it in a distribution channel like that is, is brilliant because nobody is doing that. There are speaker companies out there that, are, that really have amazing technology and have, but they're not in the distribution channel. You know, it's direct sales only or, yep. you know, and it, it keeps those numbers down. But when you can expose a good tech to the masses and key, and, and the, the other great thing is this also keeps it out of the, you know, DIY realm, um, keeps it with the integrators, but with the extremely strong distribu uh, distribution channel, that's a win-win because what does that do? That drives price to the dealer down, that drives price to the consumer down so now they can get a better tech at a better price 
There's just so many things about the model that make it work. So Joe, Joe touched a good point there too, just, just via the fact of um, pricing structure was a little difficult to deal with too before. Having a direct line and then having a, uh, you know, a distribution line, you're, you're battling two prices and is this guy gonna wanna go dealer direct because it's a large job? You know, we're gonna cut all that out. It's gonna be one main pricing structure and, and to Joe's point, it's just gonna be a lot easier and, and less, less DIY type guys, absolutely. Is this the, is this the model that, again, to kind of borrow from our last story, is this the model that most companies need to now follow? That they need to, if, if they really want to embrace the, the custom integration channel, that they need to find a partner or, or, or find a way to get into mass distribution and make things available to dealers where, let's say, they expect to find them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and put it into that, that structure where they can go and place one PO and get wire and get a panel and get, you know, switching and signal management and everything else, no matter what they're looking for and put that all together. Is that where we're going to, are we getting away from, unless you're a top tier crazy brand that you're not going to sell direct? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, let me, can I tell you in about a year and let you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, d- we debated this obviously when the first talks were going on uh, as to whether we should continue that philosophy or not. And I'll be real honest, our company just wasn't set up that way. And, and honestly, from a standpoint of how we feel, yeah, we feel that for us to start a brand uh, that was started, but trying to, you know, relaunch this brand, we need to rely on our our partners that got us to where we were at. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're relying on our partners that we've supported uh, through distribution. Um, And we know that those guys are going to treat those dealers just as well as we would. Um, And and we feel it's just a better way to control inventory and pricing, to be honest. Very good. I, I would say, you know, that what he just said and then you add to the fact that there are some brands that can do well with that model Mm -hmm. you know vanco the previous one we just mentioned snap av because they have you know a big inventory a lot of things you can choose from you can cover so many bases for niche companies or those you know you uh, personality branded companies you know that necessarily won't work you know and people have tried but but companies that actually figure out how to consolidate a lot of what our needs are mm-hmm. they flourish in that they being dealer direct would be a horrible idea for them well and that's that's something that i always look at is when there's the option of dealer direct and and we've got a couple companies that my personal company purchases from and i can get product a dealer direct officially, I can get it through multiple channels of distribution. The paperwork and the time savings for personnel in placing an order and being able to go and get it from supplier A, and as I said earlier, put four or five different channel pieces on that one PO is so much faster than having to place seven different POs to seven different suppliers who are all selling me direct. Yeah, sometimes I might be able to get a slightly better price on something, but if I've then got to pay shipping or or whatever other issue is involved, there's no there's no benefit to me as the dealer, which is why I I really do wonder if that dealer direct model, again with with some exception obviously, but for most companies, if that's going away. Right. Well and I think you kind of hit it on the head even even when you're talking pricing, maybe I get a better price, but at the same time, are you having to buy X pieces, right? So yeah. Stock 12 eight inch speakers on my truck because I got to hit that price where you can go through distribution and these guys are going to sell it to you one, two pieces at a time because they're, re- you know, we're relying on them for stock. I mean, that, mm-hmm. that's the beauty of that channel right there is, yeah. you know, I, I, I imagine as a dealer uh, uh, and an integrator, it's very difficult to get 
paid right when you need to be. And you know, that that's the beauty of, of utilizing distribution. Um, you know, you're not having to carry that much stock on your truck at all times. So I see that as just an advantage, but you're right. There's some, some companies that just handle it and have been handling it for a long mm -hmm. time to do that. But, um, I think for guys like us getting into this, it, it's, it's an excellent way for us to really control uh, inventory and pricing for, for everyone. Beautiful. All right. Well, let's move on. And, and again, if you haven't checked out Beal speakers, definitely take a look because they're, they're fantastic. All right. Thank moving you. on to a, you like that little plug, didn't you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> moving on to an article that comes to us from CE Pro. Why smart home energy data is the key to hooking consumers. Now, we all know that smart homes and, and, and all that uh, IoT products are, are really going to be a, a big boom in our, our side of the, the industry. And, and it's that thing that every consumer is going to be looking for, whereas they may not all be looking for a dedicated theater room. That being said, how does a dealer go in and, and go about getting that data and, and realizing that that is where they're going to be able to truly manage things by, by pulling that data. Joe, and of course, this is a, a fairly long article, so take a moment to, to check it out. But Joe, what is the purpose of putting in smart home technology if you're not measuring it and using that information to further the inner operability of those products? Um, comfort, safety, peace of mind, entertainment. You know, you can nail, you can nail it to four <laughs> things really quickly. Um, I mean, it's it's a good article and it has some good points. Um, at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. If you look at mm -hmm. those numbers, you know, you know, ten percent cost savings on you know electrical within HVAC and. That being seventy-five to one hundred and seventy-five dollars a year, that could be a double-edged sword at the same time. Yeah, because you know that could say I'm going to have negative ROI for two decades, um, dep depending on what the spin, you know, what the spend is, what the total spend. Yeah. Yes, if you're just talking about a Nest thermostat, if I only have one in my home, I'm going to get ROI in two years. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, your typical household that purchases smart home technology has somewhere between two and five. So they're looking at a decade just to recoup the spend of some thermostats. So, you know, you convert that into solar unless you're using huge solar arrays and geothermal where you're pushing power back to the energy company and getting a check from them every month. It's a very big double-edged sword. Data is great, but until we can produce, you know, solar and other devices at a cheaper cost that actually give an offset, the numbers can have a negative implication. And, and you're, you're reading my mind, but Mark. <laughs> well, I've well, been down this road a billion times. Well, no, it just, it, it, I'm glad that you, you, you spun it and I'm glad that the article spun it on thermostats because that's obviously one of the instant or, or sorry, initial jump ins that people do when they're doing smart home is they go get a Wi-Fi thermostat and it's all the rage, but you know, I, I know that we're big uh, lighting control dealers and every now and again, that ROI question will come up I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to save so much money on, on my lighting control. What's the, you know, when am I going to see that ROI on it? When am I going to break even? And we just kind of look at them and smile because you don't actually want to have that conversation with lighting control. Especially but, if they're putting in all LEDs. Well, exactly. One million years <laughs> to recoup your investment because those LEDs use no power. Exactly. Exactly. So Mark, it, when you're selling or, or, or even going after that smart home market, do you actually want to get into the number conversation or do you want to talk convenience? Cause you're always going to have that client who they just want to hammer you on that ROI number. And I'd argue that a lot of times you don't ever want to touch that ROI number. And do you, I mean, another thing to always think of is, do you really know the ROI number? Do you, have you looked, <laughs> I mean, how many people, if we ask the population, hey, I, I got my Nest thermostat, and when's the last time you looked at a report? 
Mm -hmm. When's the last time you maybe looked at your, you know, phone? Let, let's be honest. Most of it's marketing and ease. I mean, it's, um, it's all right here, right? Like you all want to do it, everything from here. So if we can do that, um, it's going to make the ease of it. I, I would be shocked. For example, we all companies have control systems on matrices. Do you think guys go and look at the log every time to see what switched correctly, uh, you know, in between that, that data? I think that's a that's the toughest thing is how much are they really analyzing it, and you know maybe electrical is a little easier to 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 follow. But um, to your point with uh, AC and, and thermostats, it's easy. But when you get into lighting, it's going to vary. It's a variance between what bulbs you use and what mm -hmm. you know even fixtures you 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 use and wattage. So that that's. Uh, I think it's an ease in a marketing spec more than anything. Um, and, and it is easy, right? We all want to be able to just turn things on with the flip of a, a button on a phone. And uh, it's all gone that way. I don't think it's ever been a choice. We, we all have to kind of go that way now. Um, I, I'm sure the building market, um, I, I'm sure the building market finds it interesting because it's probably a lot more DIY now than it ever has been. Yeah, for sure. We could say it and some other things. But you know that the, the important part is that there's there's now some transparency to mm -hmm. their actual data availability. And and that's important in the fact that within we'll say by 2025, which is what, seven years younger or so, um, we're actually gonna be able to see those trends. We're yeah. actually gonna be able to see those numbers over long term to say, okay, at, at this point whether it be five, 10 years down the road, this actually became affordable when you look at an ROI. We're, we're, we're getting to that point where all this data is being collected and now we're going to have benchmarks. Yeah, and, and real world benchmarks. We're play the new brands, creating new lights and new bulbs and new thermostats that if I want to market based on an ROI perspective or on a cost savings per year, I now have benchmarks that have been set. Now that, that is important. That is amazing for this industry, is that now we can set yearly benchmarks based off of real user data, and now we can build more efficient and better products after the fact. I can't use this to sell a thermostat now to save my life, but here in 10 years, somebody's <laughs> gonna look at that data, and they're gonna build me one I can. That's where the strength of the data is. So, so here's my question to both of you, and, and we'll end on this. Do you think by 2025 that we will actually be to a point where we're going to be marketing on ROI for the industry on, on these smart devices, or are we still going to be preferring to market over ease of use? Will the numbers support it? Uh, I, I think, I think just the ease of use is always going to be an overwhelming standpoint. Uh, Un unless the savings are just that dramatic, I just don't see them ever wanting to lead with, hey, remember, this is easy to use. You know, this is simple. <laughs> I'll do it. Well, so, you, oh, and it saved you money. So. Mark, Mark is right about that because, you know, I've tried, you know, that tactic where you, you look at the cost savings when using a whole house battery and solar panels and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you can equate lighting control or thermostat or any of those other control options and you can say you know on your average day you're going to spend five minutes a day turning off lights somebody else left left on mm -hmm. and, you know, that equates to a week in a year that's a week you didn't spend with your family because you were cutting the lights off that your kids left on turn the lights off and spend time with those kids you know it's just it's one of those there, there is actually a, a life-saving type, you know, I'm yeah. enjoying more of my life by getting this convenience. That's a good conveyance because it is all about us, you know, either doing that or being a little more lazy. I'll pay 200 bucks for me to not have to get off my couch during the Super Bowl. I'm going to do it. So that's always going to be the bigger seller, I think. I don't think within 10 years we'll be there. Is the ease also saving you ROI, right? I mean, maybe the yeah. ease of being able to say, oh, crap, I left the lights on. Well, there's the ease of knowing that from my phone, and boom, now I just save myself whatever. I didn't leave the lights on all weekend. 
Exactly. So that's, kind of, that's what's really interesting is the ease, and it, it's kind of double double sided. Eventually, maybe the ease and the ROI are going to be kind of dual advertised at that point. I, I, I didn't leave my right. garage door open, and I didn't get cats on my Ferrari. That's Perfect. right. Perfect. No cats in the Ferrari. You have a Ferrari. No cats in the Ferrari. <laughs> you haven't met a uh, uh, Skrillex then. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. Joe, where can people connect with you? Um, they can find us at uh, thethoughtfulhome.com. Follow us on Twitter at Thoughtful Home or get with us at Facebook at The Thoughtful Home. Beautiful. Mark, thanks for joining us on your, on your first show. Where can people connect with you? Uh, you can uh, connect with us on Facebook at Vanco as well as uh, on our web, vanco1.com and now uh, getbeal.com. So check it out, please. Beautiful. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. For myself, if you'd like to follow me, you can find me at Matt D. Scott on Twitter and every other social platform. But more importantly, please stop by avnation.tv. You'll find this show as well as a wide variety of our other shows with all the verticals that we cover. When you visit the website, please take a moment to check out our underwriters. We're extremely thankful for their support and ask that you support them as well. Thanks again for watching. That's all the time we have for this episode of Resi Week.